Hello, everybody. Hi, uh, I'm Scott Hinson. I'm the CTO of Pecan Street. Thank you for joining uh, me this afternoon. I hope that uh, you enjoy this presentation. Uh, I am uh, sorry that for anybody that was looking forward to uh, uh, doing this in person that we can't, but it's the way this goes right now. So um, uh, we'll do the best we can. Normally, I, I do a lot of uh, audience interaction, so please please uh, get those questions in um, uh, early and often. Uh, a lot of times the questions help me make sure that I'm, I'm addressing the uh, what, what people are interested in hearing about. Uh, I am in a room full of equipment, so occasionally you may hear things happening in the background. I will try not to let that distract me too much, uh, but we've got some active tests running for some national labs right now, and so you've got uh, some equipment that you'll occasionally uh, hear come on and turn off. In fact, it, it, it turned on a few seconds ago. Um, so, uh, the, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, uh, a program that Pecan Street, uh, my organization did in partnership with Austin Energy called Shines. Uh, it is, uh, a DOE research program, uh, around energy storage, renewables, um, getting more, uh, solar systems, uh, and distributed energy resources onto the grid, uh, in a low carbon, uh, way. Um, but first, a little bit about us, Pecan Street. We are a um, 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we have a, sort of a three-pronged approach to how we, we do uh, business in the world. Uh, the first is, is that we do a lot of field research. We have uh, some very generous volunteer participants that work with us nationwide. We install equipment in their homes to monitor electricity usage, water usage, natural gas usage, uh, and we get a lot of data points, okay? Uh, we uh, have what we believe is the world's uh, largest uh, private database on residential energy usage. Um, in fact, even if we were uh, a utility, we think that we'd still have the world's largest database. Uh, we have homes uh, that because of the types of data that we collect, uh, generate 10 and a half million data points a day. We collect 2.5 billion data points a day on electricity usage alone. Um, and so the, the amount of data that we, we collect is, is fairly staggering. Uh, every second of uh, every day for these homes, for every single circuit, we collect five data points. Um, and that is uh, real power, parent power, and I'm gonna use some electrical engineering terms because that's what I am, but we'll, we'll get back to those in a second. Real power, apparent power, um, phase angle, distortion on the current and the um, uh, magnitude of the current. And, and we do that because um, when you start putting all sorts of devices like batteries and solar panels onto a grid that already has um, sort of energy efficiency devices like a modern air conditioning unit um, or a um, uh, uh, you know, compact fluorescent light bulbs, LED light bulbs, uh, computer power supplies. There are some very interesting interactions that happen with those devices. Um, and unless you are measuring at a very high resolution with very special equipment, you don't see those interactions. And if you just ignored them, bad stuff could happen. And, and you know, a problem's not gonna go away because you're ignoring it. Um, and uh, the last, uh, not least, is that we have a testing and verification lab. Um, and so, so between field research where we, we put stuff out in folks' homes, where we've got this measurement equipment, uh, and we can see the impact that it makes on their energy usage, their energy efficiency, uh, how they interact with the, the energy, water, uh, natural gas world around them, um, uh, turning that data over to researchers worldwide and, and corporations worldwide, and then testing individual devices before we put it in the field in our lab, um, we have a full suite of things that we can do for uh, um, federal programs, uh, private research grants. Um, uh, we've had uh, grants from Sloan Foundation. We just got another grant from the Government Foundation. So these are private grants that are uh, private entities that are looking to, to seed uh, research in certain areas. So SHINES is a program that we did with Austin Energy um, and the Department of Energy. Um, and uh, it had uh, three major components. What we were trying to do with Shines was understand how you could use energy storage and smart 
connected Internet of Things devices to increase the grid's ability to host distributed resources, distributed generation, and lower the cost of electricity. Okay, um, and and it, it's it the cost of electricity is not just the cost of the fuel that it takes to generate that electricity and get it to you. There's a whole bunch of other costs. There's there's um, uh, capital equipment costs. There's uh, operational costs. There's all kinds of things. Uh, and and in a world, you know, going back 20 years ago, when all electricity was generated at a massive, you know, relatively small number of, of centralized power plants, you knew exactly which direction the power was flowing on the wires, and exactly, uh, and you could have um, a pretty easy way to to sort of um, uh, anticipate what the load was going to be on any given circuit on any given day based on weather. That has all changed, right? Now you've got a, um, a system where people have control of thermostats remotely. The thermostats are learning. If they think people are out of the house or in the house, they're gonna turn things on and off. Um, they may have solar on the roof and it may be generating uh, quite nicely in one area, but a mile away, it, it is cloud cover and, and generation is very low. And all of these things mean that uh, utilities are under increasing pressure to manage these power flows. And there's cost to that, right? And so a smarter management of these things could reduce their costs. They may be able to avoid um, uh, upgrades to circuits. Uh, there's something called congestion management in the utility industry where they're, they are managing um, uh, how much power is on, a, on those wires at any given point uh, so they don't have to go in and put new bigger wires in, right? You've, you've seen this, if you're driving, well, I noticed this, uh, I may be the only one that notices this, <laughs> or, or, or other utility folks uh, notice this, but I've driven down the road and I'm watching um, very expensive uh, uh, wire towers go in right next to older, smaller ones. And, and either that is because of population growth, or it may just be because they have some sort of constraint on the system that, that they're trying to manage. And energy storage systems and the proper operation of energy storage systems may be able to avoid that, right? So that's one of the things that we want to look at. So for the Shines program, we were looking at three classes of energy storage and sort of three classes of um, uh, devices, um, uh, three classes of devices that uh, are useful. Um, first is utility scale storage. Uh, the next is uh, commercial scale storage. So sizes for a business. Utility scale storage is typically on the order of uh, megawatt hours of storage with megawatt peak uh, power capabilities. Um, to put that into perspective, that will run hundreds if not thousands of homes, right? Um, uh, Commercial scale storage systems are somewhere between 30 kilowatt hours to 150 kilowatt hours, sometimes a little larger, and maybe 75 kilowatt peak. Uh, and that's enough to, to offset some of the production of the business, and there, there's some economic reasons why they might do that. And then residential systems might only be 10 kilowatt hours, well, and five kilowatt peaks worth of delivery. Well, they all come at different costs, right? Um, and if you just look at uh, kilowatt hours of storage versus cost, the utility scale systems win every time, okay? But the utility scale systems can't always be put exactly where you need them. It's very difficult to sort of deed the land and do all these things. So now you can put smaller commercial scale systems and tiny residential systems exactly at the point where you'd want them. Um, and now they become far more useful. So there were, part of the study was that we were looking at was to figure out if, um, the residential systems had a lower overall cost of energy usage, even though their, their equipment cost up front might have been higher. Okay? So what did we install? We installed, um, we, we say here that we've got six energy storage systems. We actually have a seventh in our lab, and then we added a vehicle to grid. So out in the field, in, in, in the wild, uh, on, on participants' homes, we had six energy storage systems. We also had additional smart inverter systems. And we have communications established with every single one of these systems. Um, and we have very high speed communications established. And I'll get into that uh, in a little bit. That's, that's pretty important. Um, and, and 
we we have this neighborhood that we work with all the time. Uh, we have a very large number of our participants in this neighborhood, um, and what we have done is we 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 did a volunteer program. We said, hey, look, we're going to replace your inverters, your older inverters, with these new smart ones, but you got to agree to, to to participate in the program. We're going to put uh, energy storage systems on your houses, but you got to agree to participate in the program. And we had very quick uptake, very quick uptake. Um, uh, in a matter of uh, days, we had the entire program uh, filled in terms of volunteer participants. But what we did is that we clustered all of these devices onto what the utility industry calls a feeder, um, which means uh, they are basically all on the same wire. Uh, then, and we can synchronize their operation and, and see the impact that it has for the entire neighborhood based on what these few houses are doing, okay? And that's one of the reasons why we needed the, the high-speed communications, because we needed to be able to synchronize the reaction of these devices based on the measurements that we were getting back from the utility and the requests that we were getting back from the utility. So what do these systems uh, from a, a block diagram level look like, okay? Um, this is a slide I stole from, from early on in the program. Um, we, we basically communicated with all of the device, uh, devices through Modbus. This brings me to an important point for the industry in general. Uh, and, and I think uh, I'm doing some um, stuff with the Linux Foundation energy uh, portion around this as well. Um, we need better standardization, right? Um, I'm old enough to remember when I would have to worry if my Wi-Fi router was compatible with the very, very early Wi-Fi um, cards that I would put onto uh, 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 an ISA or a PCI slot into a computer, right? Um, and all of those things are, are taken care of behind the scenes right now. We're not at that point in the smart IoT uh, type things for renewable energy devices. Progress is being made. SunSpec Foundation, there's a whole bunch of, of sort of standards that are coming online, but the compliance with these standards um, isn't as high as I would like. Um, when I did the Shines program, when we did all of the programming for the inverters, I had two different companies, one for the inverters for the solar systems, one for the inverters for the batteries. These are the boxes that basically take the DC energy off of the solar panels and puts it onto the grid or the DC energy out of the battery and puts it onto the, uh, to the AC grid. Two different companies, they were both supposedly SunSpec compliant, and I had to write completely different software to access the exact same functions. If I just wanted to measure voltage or current or something like that, which was the exact same between the two of them, I had to access different registers, I had to do all sorts of different things. Fast forward almost three years, and I'm currently, as I'm standing here in, the, in, in this room, I've got equipment where I'm doing some tests for a national lab. Again, I have two different inverter companies, I still have to use different software <laughs> for <laughs> accessing the same functions in those two different two different devices. So there is a real challenge in sort of maintaining that code base. Okay, um, uh, I talk about this, um, uh, it, it, and and part of it is is that the industry is so fast moving. We started the program, and products were new when we started and were end of life to, before we could get them into the field. Um, and, if, and if anybody uh, that's listening to me right now has ever worked with utility, utilities um, are notoriously slow moving organizations, okay? Um, it was described to me best uh, one time as saying that they're no enabled, uh, which is not typically what you see in, in a startup culture. I've worked for a couple of different startups. It is, it is not typically what you see even in, in sort of larger corporate America. In the utility industry, you will almost never get into trouble for saying no to a new idea, right? Um, and they have good reason to, um, but basically what this means is, is that it is hard to try new things. So we were very fortunate that Austin Energy wanted to try uh, some new things with experimentation of, of aggregating these batteries, aggregating the responses for all these smart inverters and, and getting them to solve some real world problems. But it's it's uh, one of the reasons that this, this program is so rare is because Austin Energy is one of the few utilities to do that. The reason that they have that mindset is because 
if something happens and people lose power, that's really bad. On this same feeder that I'm talking about right now is actually one of the communications and command centers for the state of Texas for emergency response. So it's, it's deemed critical infrastructure. Um, so we, we, we can't do anything that would threaten or jeopardize a power outage at that facility. Now they have backup power and things like that, but, but even that is not 100%, right? So you don't wanna cause a problem. Um, the way that it was described to me once, and I think this is a bit overstated, but, but it's, it's the way that, that um, the, the mindset of a lot of utility folks are, is, is uh, changing something on the electric grid is like working on an airplane that you're flying in. Right, you don't necessarily want to make a change. Now, I think that's a little over the top, um, but uh, but I can see their point, right? So, one of the things that we wanted to study was during this program is is sort of the impact of these batteries, and was it always good? <laughs> um, and the answer is most of the time. Sometimes it was bad, um, and then um, what were the things that that based on our assumptions up front? What were the things that we, knowing what we what we knew then and knowing what we know now, what would we have done different? What did we miss? Okay, so um, the the first thing uh, that I, I want to talk about is is the is the missed opportunity okay, of of the standards. And I've already mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, right? We have we have got to figure out where uh, a system where these devices are pretty universal, right? Um, utilities especially do not have the staff um, or the technical expertise to manage um, uh, residential or small commercial systems, especially if they were different, right? Um, and, and they had to they had to maintain different code bases for different devices. They have enough work managing their utility scale systems okay um this is uh this graphic is taken out of uh one of some of the, the california rule 21 um uh, documentation uh and you can see where if the utility is talking directly that's that top and i'm pointing at my screen like that's gonna help uh the the um if the utility is talking directly to the der the distributed energy resource client then there's a standard around that. There's an IEEE standard. If they're talking to any kind of aggregator type system, the communications between the aggregator and the end resources are out of scope and not specified. So, so there was a lost opportunity with, within this Rule 21 to sort of help force this. Now, I've talked to the, to the folks that, are, uh, um, that, that did a lot of this work. I understand the reasoning behind it. Um, uh, we basically had to end the conversation with, well, we're going to have to agree to disagree for a while. Um, but there's, there needs to be something that forces that. Anything, like even within the SunSpec standard, if you, if you get deep enough into it, there's vendor exception for almost everything you want to do. Well, that leads to me having to write different software for every single inverter that I want to go talk to. The next thing uh, that, that's a missed opportunity, and I've circled it here, is if you look at the time scale that um, you want to talk to these devices, if you're actually trying to solve momentary sort of voltage control, congestion management type issues on the utilities infrastructure, you need to be able to talk to them fast and you need to be able to get them to do what you need them to do fast. Okay, so if you, if you need them to put more power onto the grid or if you need to take them power off of the grid and store energy, or if you need them to put, um, a, um, you know, uh, grid services, which are known as volt bar or bar compensation, reactive power compensation, you need to be able to ask for that and, and ask for it quickly. We didn't know exactly how quickly we wanted to, to, to do this. So we just set up a 10 second sort of generic response time. We'd like the thing to respond within 10 seconds. We actually set that thinking it was abnormally fast and that it would be hard to do and um, uh, that we wouldn't ever need it. And it turned out not only would we likely have needed it uh, had we had good enough measurements, but it wasn't all that hard to do and was completely scalable. So, so um, in the, again, I pulled this out of the rule 21, they're talking about residential and I've got it circled there or the aggregator systems only having to respond in minutes um, or hourly day ahead. 
right? So now they're asking for these systems which have the capability of responding on a second by second basis. And they're, they're by standard sort of handicapping them um, uh, to respond slower. Uh, and we found that that was not, not particularly useful, right? Like, like we had some examples, um, the, uh, and I'll get into this uh, in a bit, where the, the scheduling system uh, was re reacting quite quickly and we, you know, we were reacting to them within 10 seconds, but we probably should have set that at a one second interval basis and it would have been more useful, okay? Now, before I go to the next slide, um, I have worked very hard to, to avoid sort of um, detailed electrical engineering power distribution stuff. And I have one slide that, that uh, has this sort of detailed power distribution engineering type stuff in it. And I'm going to describe it with no math. So you're going to have to sort of go with me here because I'm going to use some very simplified language to describe what is actually a fairly complex issue but it is a huge missed opportunity in terms of uh, the marketplace for distributed resources. It is one of the things that prevents, um, that is going to start preventing um, higher penetrations of distributed resources. It's one of the things that, that if a utility was inclined to not put more solar on, that they can start to point at and say, well, we can't put more solar on this feeder because this is happening. Well, they're right, there are fixes for this. You probably shouldn't put more on there, but it's, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity that we see. Okay, so <laughs> with that warning, <laughs> um, now I've got everybody scared. I'm like, there's no math, trust me, there's no math. Um, uh, what I've done is I've uh, taken basically an oscilloscope capture of the voltage and current uh, going into a single house, okay? The two green lines, are the voltage. And that should be, and this is, this is the closest we're going to get to math, that should be a nice smooth sine wave. So that up and down and up and down, that should be a nice smooth sine wave. Okay. Um, and the way houses work is you've, you've actually got 240 volt power coming into, but it's, it's what is known as split phase. So when one voltage is going up, the other voltage is going down. So that's why you see the two green lines doing this nice number uh, on top of each other. In a perfect world, the current would also be a nice smooth line, okay? It would be a very nice smooth sine wave like you see the voltage doing. Notice that they kind of look like shark's teeth. That's, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's, there's ways to describe that math, but, but they kind of look like shark's teeth. They're, they're, it's a sharp jagged thing. And not only that, but it doesn't always line up. It, it kind of shifts in time like this. And, and that is um, a interaction between modern devices, compact fluorescent lights, electronic power supplies, variable speed drives, all the new electronics and houses that are great for energy efficiency, but they are relatively poor for what is known as power quality. In all of the Shines research that we did, in all of these devices that we looked at, this was not addressed, okay? None of them fix this current shark's tooth problem. And it's going to start to become more and more of an issue as solar penetration gets higher and higher in, in the United States. Um, we're seeing issues uh, in Hawaii already for this. There's uh, at the IEEE Power Engineering Society Convention, there is all sorts of talk about this. Um, and, and years ago, I gave a speech on it um, and I had a bunch of data uh, and I had a bunch of um, uh, distribution engineers come up to me and argue with me. One of them got so mad that, that they pointed a finger at me and then just walked off. They couldn't, they couldn't communicate why they had such a problem with what I was saying. But I was like, look, we, we need to be talking about this. And the last time I went, they didn't invite me back to speak for another five years. Um, but the last time I went, there was like six or seven presentations on stuff like this. And everybody was talking about, yeah, this is an issue we're seeing. And, and, and I kind of wanted to say, I told you so. But um, uh, this is still a missed opportunity. This will have to be addressed. Um, it'll probably be at a lower level um, than, um, uh, uh, it'll probably be a lower level uh, than, than uh, direct device or something you'll, you'll ask for in the device, like, like through a Modbus register or a TCP IP connection or something like that. But it is something that we need to watch out for. Ah, I see a question came in. Uh, machine learning. 
We'll get to that in a second. Uh, we will get to that in a second. I, I have uh, some some plots on that um, or some some slides on that in a bit. So uh, I see the question about machine learning uh, and, and the use cases for it. Um, uh, and I, and somebody please remind me if I don't talk about it. I'd also like to talk about sort of uh, some of the um, uh, some of the concerns around machine learning uh, that a lot of utility folks uh, currently have. So if I don't get to that, somebody please remind me. Okay, so the next thing that you have to understand is that um, in the Shines program, one of the challenges that we had was uh, integrating a whole bunch of different devices and presenting that to utility as one resource. So we had inverters, we had uh, energy storage systems, we had a vehicle to grid system, and we had to make all of those devices and, and sort of simplify them down, and open ADR was a great way for us to do that, um, but, but um, it, it didn't have everything that we wanted um, as a program, so you can, you can add extensions to it, you can add on to it, but again, the, the, that sort of takes away from the standardization of it, right? So our open ADR system, we can't just turn around and connect that to a different utilities open ADR system and, and accept their commands. Like that handshake is not gonna be universal between between us. And we want to get to the point where it is, right? That 2030.5 is, is a great, it, like that, that's hopefully long-term gonna, gonna fix all of that, but that wasn't finalized um, and, and widely accepted when we did our initial works. Um, it, it came out sort of, in the process and then we we're like well we probably should have done it this way but oh well we're 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 in we're in it for what we're doing right now it's too late now um so we aggregated um a car a uh, vehicle to grid and we were the first people to do vehicle to grid in the state of texas um and one of the things uh that we discovered was that um your field research for these devices is critical now i don't expect anybody to study this flow chart and sort of really understand it the, the fast version of this is when we plugged the car into the charger, and remember I said we were doing things on a 10 second basis, every 10 seconds we were asking the car, how much energy do you have in your battery? Because we had some rules that we wanted the car to be available, okay? We didn't want somebody to get into a car and have, have a big discharge event just happen and not be able to go anywhere in the car. So we said, all right, we need to set a baseline. We'll never go below a certain state of charge for this, this um, uh, battery system. We need to keep the battery so that you have at least 40 miles worth of range. We live in a fairly dense urban section of Austin. 95% uh, of uh, the trips that we were making in, in vehicles uh, for the staff that were going to be using the vehicle uh, was less than 20 miles a day. So we just doubled it and we said, all right, we're, we're going to guarantee you 40 miles. So that way, no matter what happened, somebody got into the vehicle, they had the, the range. There are two battery systems. And this is sort of a, uh, be careful what you ask for. Make sure you do your field testing well before rolling a bunch of stuff out. There are two battery systems in, a, in an electric vehicle. There's the energy storage system for propulsion. And then there's the 12 volt accessory, 12 or 24 volt um, accessory uh, electronic system. Well, that battery is kept online every time you ask the car for a uh, state of charge. So remember I said we were doing that every 10 seconds? We bricked the car. <laughs> we ran that battery down so low that when we went to get into the car to move it for uh, some visitors that were coming to our facility, which just so happened to be the Texas State Public Utility Commission, good planning on our part, uh, we couldn't move the car because we had killed the battery. <laughs> So we had to do all kinds of stuff. So this is again why the standardization of how you communicate with these devices and even within the device is sort of making sure that you have good information available. This particular car would give us a state of charge. There are some vehicles um, and some charging standards that you can't get the state of charge out of. You have to get into the vehicle telematics. So now you've got a different communication system. So all of these things go to show, um, A, the opportunity is there to do all this stuff, but B, there's still a lot of work needing to be done to sort of understand the, the, the uh, ecosphere of, of when you're going to do this kind of communication, do this kind of work, what you're gonna break and what you are gonna be able to get to and do. Um, let's skip that, that's a, uh, 
relatively long or not relatively, that's eh, kind of a longish video ish. Um, so the, the two, and this gets back to that machine learning question that, that came in, the two use cases that we had for V2G were utility peak load reduction and real time price dispatch. Now I'm going to take a quick step back and sort of describe uh, these two for the folks that, that aren't uh, utility centric uh, listening in. Peak load reduction is massively important for every utility. It is exceptionally important in Texas. There are three electric grids in the United States. Okay. Um, well, there's more than that, but three main for the continental United States, there are three main electric grids. Okay. There's effectively East Coast, West Coast, and Texas because Texas. Um, and Texas, because it is a relatively small uh, grid, uh, can't, uh, and, and because of the rules of the marketplace, we can't ship a lot of power out of the state and we can't get a lot of power into the state. So the state of Texas has to manage itself in terms of the minimums and the maximums, which is the toughest time for utilities to manage these things. Um, and, and the maximum is, is the most critical. Last summer, um, if I don't know if anybody remembers the news, we hit 8,000 or $9,000 a megawatt hour, which works out to $9 a kilowatt hour electricity. Um, Meanwhile, most residential uh, customers in the state of Texas pay an average of about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So, so $9 versus 10 cents. There were utilities losing a lot of money if they had to go buy energy on that, that last minute spot market. So peak load reduction. This is important for batteries because they're a great way for utilities to save money on, on that peak load. Utilities in Texas have to pay for their share of the transmission system based on four 15 minute periods in the summertime. Uh, 15 minutes in June, 15 minutes in July, 15 minutes August, 15 minutes in September. They have to, they pay millions of dollars a year based on that one hour total of time. So if they have an energy storage system that they can dispatch, that basically means they're not taking uh, a bigger share of the peak. Um, it also means that they're sticking the utilities that don't have energy storage with the, that portion of the bill, but hey. Um, and so that was one of the use cases for the car because we can get a lot of energy out of the car quickly. The other one that we looked at for the car was what is known as real-time price dispatch. That's basically um, uh, buy low, sell high, right? Um, so you can buy cheap energy and then sell it when energy is more expensive. And you're literally just making money based on the fact that uh, once you get past the losses, the efficiency of the system, this is where the machine learning comes in. You have to have very good predictions on A, when those peak periods are coming, and B, when energy prices are going to go up and down so you do the right thing. When we first turned on the system, we were getting commands from the, the machine learning uh, engine uh, that Austin Energy was, was running, um, and it wasn't... Uh, it was, it's advanced, but I wouldn't say that it's state of the art. Um, it's very good. Early versions of it were a bit confusing because they had many different things sort of requesting access to the system. And then there was an economic um, uh, dispatch that, that picked which one to do. So every once in a while we'd get really confusing things uh, like, like uh, in the middle of the summer, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, the batteries were charging. We we're like, uh, are you really doing the right thing? But the engine had done the right thing at that point. That was actually not a bad time to charge the battery because what the, the prediction had shown was that two hours from then was going to be a really great time to discharge. Okay. So they were willing to suffer a little bit and, and put uh, slightly expensive energy into the battery because they knew two hours they were going to be able to discharge and sell that energy for a lot of money. So that's where the machine learning comes in, um, especially for that, that in, in making all of those predictions, um, which brings up, um, uh, and I'll go to the next slide. Let's see if, uh, no, actually I'm going to go two slides. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. It brings up the concern that utilities have. Um, I'll get to that. So, um, the 4CP, that critical peak pricing that I was talking about, um, when it works, um, uh, and I don't want to get too much into the details of the, this chart, um, but when it works, it's quite valuable. Okay. 
the fixed energy storage systems that we put on the side of folks' houses, those 10 kilowatt hour, five kilowatt batteries, those were about $7,000 each between the batteries and the electronics and the insulation, okay? They would pay themselves back in two years if you manage to get the four CP events right, and they have somewhere between an eight to 10 year lifespan. So for a return on investment, that's not bad, okay? And that was the costs and price and payback at the beginning of the program. They've come down. I just haven't rerun the numbers. My guess is, is it's probably more like a year and a half right now. Like, like instead of eight uh, critical peak events, you would probably get paid back in six. The, um, the catch is, is that if you are basing your, um, uh, your operation of your systems, there is a perception, whether it's right or wrong with a lot of, uh, um, uh, utility folks that the machine learning agents still need basically human eyes on them, checking them and watching them. And in some cases that's true, right? Like, like we had one event, one, one, uh, peak event last summer where our batteries were being asked to charge during the peak event, which is the last thing you'd want them to do. So, uh, and what had happened was is the prediction engine had missed um, uh, when that when that peak event was, there was a uh, a sudden drop off in um, uh, production, uh, weather related drop off in production in wind power, so the prices shot up, um, uh, and then the the batteries were earlier in the day, and then the batteries were in the wrong position for the peak event, which happened earlier than they expected, and they were charging because they thought it was going to happen later, so they 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 just flat out missed right, and in that case the batteries cost a lot of money, okay? So, so that does happen, and that is, um, uh, uh, that is a, uh, a concern for the utility folks. Um, this is just an example of uh, that price dispatch that I talked about. Um, we've got um, uh, pricing on the, or state of charge for the battery on the left-hand side of this. We've got uh, price in megawatt hours. This was actually during the winter, uh, end of December, 2019. So winter prices don't fluctuate near in Texas what summer prices do on that, on that five minute spot market. Where in summertime, you can see, you know, at 3 a.m., the, the price of electricity is four, five, six dollars uh, a megawatt hour. And then, as I said, it'll be legally capped at nine thousand dollars a megawatt hour. I have to go look up what the numbers are going to be this summer. Um, it'll be interesting to see with, with uh, COVID how much that has uh, shifted the marketplace in terms of pricing. Uh, we know what it has shifted our users uh, energy usage has, has been, but we don't know what that's going to do for the pricing yet. Uh, but in this case, the the system was um, steady most of the day, price was uh, uh, fairly high uh, in the afternoon. So they did some discharges, then it sort of held, and then the prices went back up uh, uh, early evening, it discharged. And in this case, when you see 0% state of charge, that's what we were reporting to the utility. Uh, but remember I said we reserved space. So it says 0% state of charge, but that's what the utility thought. We were lying to them. We still had state of charge uh, left in the battery. And then uh, you can see we're at night, uh, about 11 p.m., uh, prices started to drop. Now, in this case, the engine started to charge too early, okay? So the bat state of charge of this battery starts to shoot up. Uh, you get to almost 100% state of charge. Uh, but if they had just waited another couple of hours, they would have gotten nearly free electricity because the, the market pr price at that point had dropped to like a dollar a megawatt hour. So and that that's that's one of those things where the utilities folks are, are like, well, you know, our, our modeling had you know, which is not based on, on true machine learning. It's, you know, frankly, it, and often uh, in many cases, it can be a, a very simple linear regression or historical average type thing. Uh, our modeling has said they should have waited and they would have been right, right? Where the machine learning engine did not get it quite right. Okay, so those are the slides that I have. I only see one question, which kind of concerns me. Um, I, I need more questions, come on. <laughs> I've got to got to have some.
Uh, we've got a question. Do you ever have time in Texas where the wholesale price of electricity goes negative? Yes, we do. Um, and it is uh, typically we have, uh, um, uh, it's typically nighttime. It's typically when the wind energy is quite high uh, and demand is low. So shoulder months where there's not a lot of heating or cooling um, for, for folks that don't live in Texas uh, in the summertime, uh, there are times when, you know, I mean, even, even if the outside temperature um, has dropped below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, there has been so much thermal energy pounded on, into that house that, that the air conditioner um, struggles to keep up uh, and will run all night long. So um, we have, situ you know, that typically doesn't happen in the summertime. But in shoulder months where it's been mild, you'll have all of this wind production. They will, they can only, you know, they can, they can shut a bunch of it off, but it gets to the point where even the base load predictions are such that uh, there's some stuff that you, you can't shut off and, and prices can go negative. Uh, long-term storage. Ooh. Um, so uh, by long-term storage, um, the question is, have you had any uh, plans for incorporating long-term storage? Uh, are you talking sort of um, like uh, some of the longer thermal and or, you know, uh, pumped hydro things that, um, is that the kind of storage? If so, uh, that's not typically done at a residential scale. and We're typically residential experts. So we basically only look at um, uh, limited amounts of thermal storage. And by that, I mean pre-cooling or preheating the structure. So um, if, you know, if you are, if you are in a very dynamic pricing area, we've done some pricing experiments where uh, we've looked at, okay, if, if, if the homeowner sees the volatility of the general energy market, does it actually make sense to cool their house an extra few degrees and leave it off uh, during, leave the air conditioner off during those peak times and let the house sort of come back up? Uh, that that is incredibly depending on how much you do of that that can be very energy inefficient right like you can only get so much of a temperature differential between the outside and inside so you're pouring a lot of energy into that air conditioning system to buy yourself a few degrees but in some cases the price swings are so high that it actually makes economic sense uh, to do that so we, we've looked at it from that perspective um, I think some of our academic researchers we turn our data over to, to you know over the history of our, our 10 year lifetime, uh, like 2,300 researchers from 80 countries have looked at our data. Um, and I think a couple of them have also looked at that and come to sort of the same conclusion that we did that, that, that depending on how dynamic your market structure is, that longer term storage um, may make sense. But at a residential scale, we don't, there's, there's very few uh, other, other uh, entities that, can, that we can put energy into for a very long period of time. Yeah, the, the hydrogen fuel cell, those are those are more of a commercial play. We're, we haven't looked at those for um, uh, for residential structures. We have looked at, um, uh, for the Northeast, we have looked at combined heat and power type systems, uh, which you're, you're using natural gas uh, to generate electricity, but you're also capturing the heat and using that in the house. But in Texas, <laughs> we don't need heat. We, like, seriously, like, they... At one point, they wanted to do some testing on one of, one of our in our facility, and I was like, "Where, where am I going to put heat? Like, I, I don't need it." I'm sure there's some commercial entities looking at that. That's the scale. Now that I think about it, um, I'll have to go. I'll, that's a. I'll have to get back to you. I'll have to go. I'll have to go look at it. I'm. I'm sure some commercial entities have at least looked at it. Whether or not they've done anything with it, I don't know. Any other questions coming in? probably should have mentioned this earlier, but um, uh, for all of our edge compute that we do, everything is Linux-based. Uh, it 
it's about the it's about the best thing that we can we can do out there. That's not my specialty. Uh, we have a, a data team that that does most of that work, but every single thing we put out there is, is Linux based. We buy hundreds, if not thousands, of Raspberry Pis per year. Any other questions? Well, um, if we don't have any other questions, I guess we can. Whoop, whoop. One more. Do we use Edge uh, Cloud or? Uh, ooh. Uh, do we use? Edge uh, computing resources cloud, or or do we deploy our own servers? The answer is yes to all of those things. Uh, it depends wildly on what we're trying to do. For our main data collection that we do, that 2.5 billion data points a day, we have our own servers. Uh, the we looked at the the cloud computing costs for that, and that was just not not reasonable for us at the time. Uh, every year we sort of re-examine that um, and it gets closer and closer every year but at this point no we're, we're doing that on, on our own servers um, depending on the uh, we're doing some uh, field trials right now where we're doing demand response with air conditioners um, and we are taking a much smaller subset of that data and at a very high speed low latency moving it up to a cloud resource where there's a bunch of computations being done on it uh, by some researchers at, at national labs and um, uh, uh, academic institutions. And then they have uh, control vectors that they send back down to the, the edge compute resources, which again, are, are just uh, um, a Raspberry Pi. Um, so those are, those are you know, uh, that mix, every project, we, I'd love to say that we have a standard framework, but every project is such, is different enough where we can't just apply a fixed framework. Um, we have to look at it and say, okay, how much data, what latency, where is it going to be, how much, um, uh, uh, how much uh, computation is going to be done on it, um, and, and then we make a decision from there. Um, if a consumer's car is used for data storage for the utility of a single lifetime. Um, yeah, so the question is, is basically, you know, how does the consumer get compensated for the wear and tear on the battery? Um, and there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of things. First off, uh, the modern variants of lithium ion batteries uh, have such long lifetimes. If their battery management systems are good at maintaining sort of uh, charge rates and discharge and max charge levels and sort of understanding temperature and cell balancing, um, that we have um, like like the the Nissan Leaf that we have, uh, we have just tortured that vehicle in terms of charges and discharges. Um, uh, we haven't really driven it all that much, but in terms of, of, of charge cycles and discharge cycles because of, of the energy storage system as, aspect of it, we've just tortured it. And, and the battery is still reporting a state of health of 99%. Um, and so we haven't actually seen it. So the, the technology, in fact, uh, there was a, a University of Texas researchers uh, that did some studies and basically they were saying that it's getting close to the point where uh, if you charge and discharge a lithium ion battery once or twice a day, um, it's lifetime, uh, depending on the exam, depending on the chemistry, it's lifetime doesn't really change from if you just set it in a room and let it exist. Like the, the fundamental chemistry breaks down so slowly at this point um, uh, and the, the charge and discharge is, is uh, so well managed on these things that, that it, it would last you know, somewhere between eight to 10 years um, uh, to a certain state of health percentage based on charging and discharging, or if you just set it there and you didn't let it get too hot, it would also last eight to 10 years. Um, <laughs> so, so in some ways that, you know, there's a, a um, you know, that, that I think that concern in, in the future will be overstated, but you do need to compensate the, the owner of the vehicle for that energy. Um, and the 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 use of that battery, and that's an ex that is that is something that the rules and regulations are just non-existent at this point. So I have no good way to, to show how that's going to get done. Um, it's just that the, the public utility commission sort of have to, to to come up with those rules and regulations. They're just not there. That was a good question. Thank you. These are all been good questions.
Uh, to put it in perspective, I actually drive a 2011 Chevy Volt, um, and uh, its battery life is still just fine. Um, so, uh, it's it, other parts of the car are not doing so well, but the battery is just fine. <laughs> All righty. Any other questions? Well, I think that is about time for us. Thank you everyone for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, uh, my contact info is, I believe at the end of the slide deck, yes. Um, and uh, I'll try and participate in the, the Slack discussion if there's any additional discussion there as well. So, but feel free to reach out to me uh, at that email address uh, either, either or. <laughs>